All right, welcome to the ERISA pandemic panel where you'll hear perspectives from across the country. During the pandemic, we've witnessed how GIS technology and geospatial analysis can support multiple levels of government services, especially with information sharing and communication of authoritative data. My name is Ann Fredericks and I serve as the chair of ERISA's professional education committee. I also work for the US Geological Survey as an associate liaison for the National Geospatial Program and as the LIDAR coordinator for the Coastal Marine Hazards and Resources Program. I'll be the monitor, moderator today, and I'm joined by a panel of experienced decision makers who are going to share their insights and reflections about their regional response during this crisis. They'll also be available to answer your questions, so I encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the application window throughout the next hour to pose your questions. We'll monitor those, and if the conversation really flowing, we'll hold them until the end and then ask the panelists. With that, let me introduce our panel. Lynn DuPont holds a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from the School of Environmental Design from the University of Georgia and a Master of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of New Orleans. She's been employed at the Regional Planning Commission in New Orleans for 20 years as a Principal Planner and GIS Manager handling Homeland Security data as well as many of the enhancement projects and land use studies in the region. Her emphasis has been in working with state and federal agencies and procuring usable data for local use. She's the governor's appointed member of the Louisiana GIS Council representing planning and development districts, past president of Louisiana ERISA, and a current member of ERISA's board of directors. She's a licensed landscape architect and GISP, as well as adjunct faculty at the University of New Orleans teaching mapping fundamentals and GIS theories and concepts within the geography curriculum. Thomas Fisher leads innovative long-term strategic planning in support of various entities' IT functions related to application development for the Cuyahoga County Enterprise GIS Department in Ohio. He spearheads relationship building initiatives with private and public sector clients, and a core element of his work is to expand the CGIS application development program capabilities into a shared service offering, which are provided to other constituents and stakeholders in the county, including local governments. He works with his CGIS team to develop and maintain operational policies, standards, and guidelines, and they proactively work with business units to implement best practices for application development, maintenance and support, database administration, GIS, and related operational services. Tom is a certified planner in GISP, a past president of the Ohio chapter of ERISA, and is currently a member of the ERISA Board of Directors. Next up, we have Lori Soule. She is the GIS manager for the city of Sioux Falls and is an adjunct instructor for South Dakota State University and has over 25 years of experience as a geographer and a GIS professional. After obtaining BA in Geography from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She came to Sioux Falls by way of Washington, D.C., and shortly thereafter obtained her M.S. in Geography from South Dakota State University. Recently, she was named as an honored scientist by the East Dakota Chapter of Graduate Women in Science, was a featured Geo Inspiration and Directions magazine, and became a member of the Board of Directors for the Black Hills Digital Mapping Association. She specializes in spatial diffusion theory and in the use of data and analytics to solve spatial problems. Finally, we have Dr. Steven Steinberg. He is the Geographic Information Officer for Los Angeles County, California. In collaboration with a team of highly skilled GIS professionals, he guides the geospatial strategy for more than 10 million residents and 100,000 county employees across 37 departments. Dr. Steinberg is a self-titled geospatial evangelist and is passionate about the use of technology to solve real problems of people in their environment. Prior to joining LA County, he served as mm -hmm. principal scientist and department head for information management and analysis at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project Authority and as professor of geospatial science at Humboldt State University, California. He continues teaching as an adjunct professor and is actively involved in geospatial leadership positions and professional organizations, including ERISA, ASPRS, and CGIA. He's co-authored two books on geospatial science applications. So a warm welcome to our panelists, and I thank you so much for joining us today. How are you all? Doing well. Well, thank you. Yep. Fantastic. 
Well, I wanted to kick this off today by asking what resources do you guys find yourselves relying upon most? And Lynn, I thought we might start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I work for the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO. So I have eight counties and 13 cities that um, I work with. They all have GIS managers for the most part. And they're both, they're all um, fairly well advanced in applications. What I'm finding the requests for is to help them with the analytical parts of prioritization of certain assets. Um, first and primarily, um, I'm using an awful lot of ACS data that has, they came out last December and helping them do some basic analysis and then some more complex analysis on um, the first one that came up was uh, a 50% cut in transit services and no one's ever happy with any decision you make. So you want to make sure you're making the best decision and I'm called in Oh, and just about every parish to help them make sure they're using a valuable data set. And if they don't have one that I have, I send that to them and we go through a lot of the analytics. That's where I've been spending my time. The Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals has been doing all of the coronavirus um, dashboards and applications and feeding that to the local governments. Fantastic. And Tom, have you experienced something similar or is your, your feeling up in Ohio a little bit different? Well, um, so here at Cuyahoga County, um, we've uh, curated data from really two primary sources. Um, uh, we have a, a county board of health, uh, which is where uh, some of our more generalized data is coming from. Um, you know, when it comes to the counts that, we're, uh, that you look at, um, very, because we're dealing with uh, personal health information, um, very uh, generalized in, in uh, what they distribute. Uh, in fact, um, you know, reporting uh, cases of COVID down to the, um, uh, to the zip code level raised some um, eyebrows locally, um, you know, and, and because it, it, was almost, it was almost too localized. Uh, by some, and I think uh, then they, they, they open that up, um, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, with, with uh, adjacent counties around us. Um, so I, I guess they were, we were sort of leading edge on, on, on that side of, of uh, the, the data uh, house. But uh, the other data that we uh, curated came from a lot of state resources. Uh, so uh, interesting, um, we had uh, our ERISA chapter um, with uh, a gentleman by the name of Dick Katapish, uh, spearheaded a, um, a task force uh, made up of a lot of folks from around the state of Ohio, um, you know, coming in, weighing in on Slack, and then also ho we hosted um, uh, some, some video chats. Um, and finding out that uh, the, the state resources, um, you know, as far as data was concerned, uh, was a little bit lacking in the early stages of, of the, the virus uh, onset. Um, and then sort of develop that uh, with uh, the state EMA and uh, state uh, board of health um, after that. So that data sort of came together as an evolution. Um, and then we started to use uh, some of that as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think the final, the last place that we actually curated data from was a local newspaper. Um, you know, one of the uh, things that, that we, we stood up an application for, and a lot of folks were doing it, um, was to help the local economy with uh, restaurants uh, that did takeout and delivery. Um, so we published a, a mapping application to identify those as well as have, adding phone numbers and websites and um, ways to, to, to order data. So not necessarily, um, you know, from a health standpoint, but from an economic health standpoint, we decided to put some applications together for that. And I think that's where, um, as the coronavirus actually, as this um, you know, in stages as it produces or goes forward, uh, you're going to find a lot more in the um, economic uh, development or economic um, uh, resurgence uh, applications coming forward, um, not just in, as a result of the, the health uh, issues related to, to coronavirus. That makes sense. And you mentioned, you know, they, they were the resources that helped you create the application. So Lori, you offline, you were ch chatting and you mentioned that, you know, where to start with the dashboards and applications. 
Did you find yourself using similar resources or could you tell us a bit about the resources that you used to make all those applications we, we discussed briefly? Uh, certainly. So our primary resource here, without a doubt, is the state of South Dakota COVID website. Uh, just like everybody else in the state, we have to wait until those numbers get updated, you know, every day at about 1130. And this has been a bit of a moving target for us, meaning the state does keep evolving as well and offers up more information for us to work with. So the heart of all of our public facing dashboards and many of our internal dashboards is the data that comes from this website. We've come up with some pretty creative ways to uh, obtain the data, trying to eliminate as much human error as possible. However, this is really the data that drives nearly all of our products because this tells us cases, hospitalizations, um, current cases as well as cases over time recovered. And then now we're starting to also get data on the demographics of it. And that's gonna be really important for our community uh, to understand that. Now, internally though, it's a bit of a different story. We really wanted early on to start to be able to monitor our workforce as this, as this event goes on over time. And, you know, like all things in GIS, right, there's always going to be that, that lowest common denominator that's going to fail you. And in this case, we did a, a failure at first that we could not, we could not automate this. Our, our business system that manages our staff just didn't quite do this in as timely a fashion as we needed. So we did have to create and curate our own data, relying on a team of about 10 to 15 leaders that give us those updated numbers on a daily basis. And that includes uh, in, you know, folks who are working on site, folks who are working remotely, folks who are out sick, folks who are out COVID, but folks who are also out for another reason, right? Maybe it's a gorgeous day today and we're gonna take today off. Uh, but similar to what Tom mentioned, we also have a lot of collaborations on the side where we noticed early on that you know, uh, numerous news organizations were saying, here's a restaurant listing page, here's a restaurant listing page, and everybody tried to sort of kind of do their own thing. So we reached out to one of our main news resources and basically just collaborated with them. And so to give that one some exposure, but also uh, to put some other partners resources in there as well. I um, agree that I think our next step with economic um, recovery is going to probably be where we go next. We do have a fund here in Sioux Falls uh, that is intended to help our residents and I can see us putting a lot of attention toward that on our public facing uh, websites shortly as well. That's a really good point and you mentioned exposure for those dashboards and apps that you were creating. Now Steve, I think you mentioned there were something like 17 that you created and after hearing that you've got 100,000 thousand county employees, that makes sense, but how did you address that kind of challenge getting those dashboards exposure? Well, I think there's a couple of things I'd note. Um, one, because we are so large, we have, you know, multiple channels of, of effort going on sort of simultaneously. So obviously, like I think all counties, um, you know, our, our emergency operations were activated and a core group of GIS staff uh, were assigned to support that. One of the things that, um, that really helps, and I think it goes to resources in a different way, is the human resource. So as we have staff both at the EOC and across our county departments working on addressing these questions of say, build a dashboard for you know, school closures and where food is available for kids on school lunch programs now to come pick it up or, um, or a dashboard to look at you know, um, park closures we did one for. So, you know, knowing, so people know where they can get out and exercise and which trails or, or facilities are open or closed. Um, we were able to leverage that human resource of staff from those departments, knowing their data really well and being able to draw those resources together um, in a timely way. Um, so I think that was a big thing as a county, we obviously have a lot of our own internal data sets, um, but I don't think there's any one person who could tell you what all of those are and which ones are appropriate. You, we really had to leverage those human resources and, and knowledge at the department levels. Um, another resource I think that really helped us was looking 
outwardly to some of the, you know, obviously it's been mentioned things that, you know, are in the ACS or the Living Atlas from Esri that they started spinning up, as well as looking to state and national data sets like Highfeld or like uh, SaberNet to look at um, which facilities, uh, commercial facilities are opened or closed. Um, so we sort of used an all of the above approach, um, leveraging you know, everybody's knowledge uh, across the GIS community in the county. And in very many cases, I'd say beyond just the GIS community, because um, in some cases it was a department that had a need and maybe they knew about some data set um, they had in an Excel sheet or some kind of a data set uh, in a database that wasn't geospatial out of the box, but we could quickly spin up. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll touch on as a human resource was also in California, most of our county GIS managers or GIOs, whatever their titles are, we have an email list that we've had for years just to chat with each other when questions or ideas come up. So very early on, we spun up a Slack uh, board with, I think it's about probably a dozen or more different topics, subtopics of COVID. And if somebody was uh, had a question about a data set or building out a dashboard for a particular thing, we very quickly could share those resources between counties um, and say, oh, here's a data set, or we've already built a dashboard for that, we'll give you our template. Um, so that was very helpful, talking across our 50 plus counties um, to in a coordinated way and eventually we got to the point of even sharing uh, doing a weekly call um, in addition to that slack board to sort of touch base at the state level so I think it's sort of a combination for uh, for us of you know leveraging that human knowledge and resource in conjunction with the technologies and data sets that that are already readily available that's made us able to do that quickly that, that's a really good point and one of the these even asked if you guys have found the need to have reports in addition to those dashboard views and Steve it sounds like you did because you you needed to be able to provide it in different formats if you will um, and they found that the dashboard lacks the ability to generate reports and they had to add another functionality for that Tom in your county have you experienced something similar are you finding additional ways to disseminate your data well I, I will tell you that um you know, we ran across that issue with the uh, State Board of, of Health, um, where they were reporting out their data um, in a, uh, you know, an infographic uh, uh, from Tableau, and I'm sure most of the people on the call today know Tableau. Um, and there actually wasn't a way to consume that data um, in the way they were publishing it. So they actually had to turn that uh, functionality on to allow for the download of, of the, the data uh, so that it could be consumed into uh, you know, by RGIS um, and then and, and used for uh, analytical purposes and, and for display purposes. So, yeah, that um, th there was a, a little bit of a digital divide there. Um, but, you know, interoperability is something that I think we're all learning to adapt uh, to, um, you know, and, and uh, uh, fill the need as, as it arises. Uh, you know, with the way uh, this evolved so quickly, um, I think we were all trying, you know, here, especially in Cuyahoga County, to try to ramp up. Um, and, and disseminate information quickly um, and responsibly um, to the point where we weren't thinking of everything um, right out of, of the gate, but uh, definitely there was enough people um, to uh, provide critique and feedback so that we were uh, able to adapt. Um, as far as publishing uh, of data um, in a raw form, we don't actively do that uh, at this point, um, but we could see how that, you know, that's something that could be helpful folks. Right. And related to that, Lori, I wondered, because you have so many resources, have you been looking at weblogs to see what groups are utilizing your resources? Rob, that's a really good question. It's from our one of our attendees. And he asked, you know, more importantly, sometimes it's good to know which groups aren't using them to help you then reach those, reach out specifically to people or, you know, other entities within the city of Sioux Falls. Have you found yourself being able to check those weblogs? Yes. So one of the things that has been particularly advantageous, I think, just kind of in general, you know, who's looking at our data. And for us, what we sort of look for too is how many people are using our data. So you could look at each individual dashboard, obviously, to see usage. But the other way we can do that is um, the way that we have all of our data pretty much shared with the public and internally is we are using ArcGIS Hub. And so we do have some Google Analytics on those numbers as well. Uh, 
the key item that I kind of look for when I'm looking at, you know, what are people using? What is the most, what is, how do we balance? What are people using with what is the most useful? And the two layers that I've noticed, of course, definitely are case data. Our case data is also probably in the largest number of derivatives as well. We're using this case data, you know, eight, 85 different ways just to try to bring out the trends in this data. Uh, the other layer though, that is uh, showing up pretty high there, not surprisingly, is that restaurant listing. It's getting a lot of it's getting a lot of feedback and it's getting a lot of actual use. I have come across so many people either in my uh, surveys on our hub page where you can, you know, hey, give us some feedback. Uh, I've gotten lots of great comments on that uh, with the usefulness of that. So we are then challenged with, all right, and you know, I don't know if anybody else on the panel thinks like this, hey, they like that. What else might be needed? Because that's a big part of our jobs too, which is almost anticipating what's next, what's down the line, or evaluating what everybody else is sharing, because there's really no benefit in, oh, I see the local newspaper is sharing this information in this way. You know, we might double check with them just to see if they're seeing some of the same trends we are. But we really don't want to make something else as a product just, just because we can. Um, that being said, if I feel that we are the authority on this data, meaning we, we are as close to the agency that's sharing the data with us and I think we can bring extra value to it, that is really what drives our next products that we're creating for the public. And of course, as always, the key is for all of our external and internal products for that matter to be extremely easy to use and sound cartographic principles. And this is probably one of our biggest challenge given the complexity of some of this data that's coming our way. That's a very valid point. The, the making sure that what you're producing is truthful and has impact does fall back to the core of us being GISPs. So that's a really strong idea and concept to stick with throughout something like this because there's that need to create content and to disseminate content but an even larger or more foundational need is to stick with our principles and ethics so i'm glad you brought that up then i wondered from within the region regional plan or even among your parishes how did you how did you deal with coordination issues did you have any coordination issues or how did you overcome them um, that's a very good question. It was a little tough in the beginning, but um, we're very tied through the state GIS Council, um, especially with health and hospitals, and down from federal and local agencies, I'll serve on that. So we have a really good network, um, mostly put in place for storms and you know, storm, not just um, response, but prevention. So we were already gearing up. We start in about March to gear up for hurricane season, make sure we have all those connections in place and we know who has what data sets and how to talk to each other. Right off the bat, um, I can say that learning how to answer questions in a group email directly into the questions, <laughs> That seemed to solve a lot of problems. Um, sometimes on the phone conversations, things would get convoluted, people go off on tangents, as we all do, especially people start for social interaction. And um, I would find that when you get off a call and you go, now what exactly were they looking for? So pu putting out a group email seemed to work better and say, okay, I'm responding in red, I'm asking this question, you respond, you know, the next one would respond in green to make sure we were all on the same page and not duplicating efforts and not kind of lost in some, you know, conundrum of conversation. So that seemed to work very well. And, and just for transferring data, you know, F, we did everything FTP because it's protected and we didn't have any problems with that. That's a really good challenge to be aware of. That's a very good point. Steve, I wondered how you're handling communication with your such having such a large team during this crisis. Well, again, I think it's 
somewhat in all of the above strategy, what Lynn just said about, you know, anything from emails to document, um, you know, questions and, and approaches and data sets and using color coding. We do a lot of that with, uh, especially people who are maybe less GIS and less tech savvy, just to sort of get a sense of what is the ask what are, and then the team can teams of GIS folks working on that ask can can then sort of you know flesh out with that that request oh is this you know what we need to get or do we need follow-up questions um, we're doing a lot of you know obviously web meetings and can coordination that way um, but and you know Skype chats and whatsapp I have you know five different chat apps and and web meeting programs in front of me almost all the time. Um, but I think probably the most effective tool we, we settled on pretty early and, and it's been very useful is Trello boards. So Trello boards, if you're not familiar, it's a web tool um, where you basically can put a, what looks like a virtual index card with a project up on the board and you can categorize them in columns based on what's active, what's you know in waiting, what's done. And then on each of these cards, when you open them up, you can put task lists with assigning people to tasks. You can put notes, you can put links to you know data sources or websites or other resources and documents. So Trello boards, especially because so many people are involved in any given dashboard or analysis or project, uh, worked really well in the sense that the teams have a place to go to see, oh, did somebody already do that? Is that checked off? If I'm coming in after them to pick up the next step, you know, where are we at? And, and, sure, and that gives us a permanent document of every project and task we've been working on. So I think as much as meetings and conversations and chats are useful, um, capturing that in an organized way that we can always go back to uh, has been probably the most important thing. Um, and, and, you know, it was something we were using a little bit in in our internal enterprise GIS team prior to this, but uh, I think we've now pretty effectively introduced it to the GIS staff across most of our departments because all of them are you know touching these in some form. Fantastic. And Steve, was that Trello? Did you say? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks so much. Uh, we just had an attendee asking about it, and I, I'm not familiar with it either, so I'd like to learn more. And that, Lori, it makes me wonder: Did you have issues with coordinating since I feel like South Dakota was one of the states that was less clear about which places needed to be considered essential or non-essential and things like that. And I just wondered if that then, you know, filtered down all the way to you. So it's funny you should mention that. One of the things that kind of emerged early on was how GIS and analytics was going to help our internal operations. So one of the things the city did almost right away was established a, a continuity of operations group, sort of the internal portion of the EOC, if you will. And I was brought onto that team fairly quickly. And one of the first things we did with our staffing was that exact thing was we determined, you know, based on, you know, first the federal guidelines regarding uh, critical positions. So collaborating with finance and human resources and many other departments and functions, we got that spun up fairly quickly. But then what we also did was our internal, in other words, you know, how do we take somebody, a department who maybe by the federal guidelines would not be considered critical, but we know that this function basically keeps the light on for that uh, service that the city provides. We did an, anal an, an analysis of all of our employees kind of determining this is essential, this is critical, and this is, you know, maybe it isn't, and that's okay too. And that did allow us when maybe the library, for example, would close and wasn't you know, seeing patrons in their physical building, we could reallocate some employees to functions that did need the initial help getting started. Maybe we needed help with our parks program, for example, because maybe we're not able to hire as many people seasonally this year. So we've been very agile in that regard. And I think what this has really brought forward too is this sort of collaborative effort that we're all in this together. You know, we kind of always talk about it as sort of on the back end as, you know, one team, one fight. 
And I think everybody's been very gracious in that regard, regardless if it's a, you know, you are critical, you must come in by a federal level, but also at an internal level for basic city services. That's an interesting perspective. Thanks for sharing that with us. And I wonder, Tom, how are you handling the communication with your team during this crisis? Well, so that's a, that is an excellent question. Um, in the, I will tell you that um, having a, a great team helps um, out tremendously. Um, so, uh, you know, how this whole thing evolved in the state of Ohio is the, you know, the first three cases uh, that were recognized were recognized here right in Cuyahoga County. Um, you know, most people will know that, that we actually have uh, one of the premier uh, health facilities in the world in the Cleveland Clinic. And so um, very progressive uh, in that, you know, over in that area of, of the county um, as far as medical is concerned. And, and when those three came on uh, or lit up, um, the, our governor, uh, who's being heralded as, as being very progressive uh, in, in his uh, move to uh, start limiting the distance of folks uh, in the state of Ohio, um, you know, much kudos to him. Um, and that's not, you know, I'm not being political there. I'm just saying that uh, he was very, um, you know, he, he took charge of the situation here in the state of Ohio, and uh, which then thrust us into a county emergency. And then uh, my team essentially uh, split up and uh, pretty much uh, everybody was, was moving to work from home. Um, and I will tell you that, uh, you know, again, having um, the flexibility or the, or the staff that, uh, that recognized that this is an unprecedented situation uh, that we were faced with um, and to be flexible. Uh, to, um, you know, adapt, uh, you know, day to day, actually, uh, as this evolved, um, was very helpful to me as, as a manager, um, to the point where we were, we were already on Slack channel um, and communicating effectively there in, inside our county building. Um, and then when we moved out, it just seemed like a natural um, evolution to still remain in those, in those uh, chat communications, uh, WebEx um, meetings when we needed to. Um, and then also coordinating with our communications department and uh, the Board of Health and uh, emergency operations. Um, you know, the, the idea is, is that, uh, you know, we were all flexible. We all used the, the tools that were at our disposal to the most effective way um, to, to help, you know, uh, communicate uh, dynamically. Um, so I, we really didn't, you know, I personally uh, would say that, that uh, it, it worked out famously. Um, and I think actually, um, you know, this is sort of an aside, but, um, you know, the here in, uh, in Cuyahoga County, uh, aside from the Republican National Convention, um, our emergency operations centers um, don't nearly have the, the type of, of action that I think uh, Louisiana or Los Angeles, uh, maybe even South Dakota from the standpoint of maybe, um, you know, strong storms and, and tornadoes and things like that. Um, we're, we're in a fairly benign uh, area of, of the country. Um, so uh, this was extra exceptional, uh, I would say, to, to Cuyahoga County. And, and I will tell you that the, the staff uh, within the county adapted uh, famously um, to, uh, you know, uh, see the need, fill the need. Um, and I'll tell you, my staff had no um, hub experience, except for to, you know, we, we knew about it. Um, we knew a little bit about its functionality, uh, but with Esri's resources and uh, other folks um, out there um, and the aptitude of uh, both Jordan Abbott and uh, Dan Gersh on my staff, uh, we were able to stand up um, a hub site uh, and coordinate effectively. So, um, you know, I, I think the, the in this together, um, is very much the mantra uh, that, that we were using as well. That uh, you know, uh, again, a back to flexibility. Um, this is unprecedented, and uh, let's work together as a team, and, and we'll make things happen. So, uh, Tom, this is Lori. I just, I think I want to follow up on this a little bit because it sounds like you and I had a similar, a similar journey. You know, when this all started at the city of Sioux Falls, we really did not have a culture of remote work. We also had so many different communication tools, but none that quite fit this new kind of normal. You know, this new normal of we can't all cram into a meeting room. You know, we had email, of course, Skype, 
numerous Slack channels. Uh, Mitel Bridge, which sort of works as a way to, you know, you could share your screen, but you can't share your video, but you are, you know, phoning in, if you will, or using your computer. Uh, but the thing that worked for us that was a, a, a huge game changer was when the coop first sort of stood up, uh, we made the decision to uh, enable uh, WebEx meetings in WebEx teams. And that for us has been such an incredible evolution of how not only my team communicates, but how I communicate with other people as well. Not only the WebEx meetings, which it's funny how at first it was so novel and new and different. And now it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's Thursday, right? It's Tuesday. This is how we do it. But I find that with the Teams function, and I'm sure there's other products that do this exact same thing, I love the idea that these conversations are maintained in one place and they don't disappear. And the fact that it works on all of my devices. You know, it's on my laptop, it's on my phone, it talks to my watch if I let it. And honestly, it feels to me like the kind of having that enterprise system where everybody can talk in the same place, regardless if you're in the office, working remotely, working mobily, having that has been, I think, what has made us so successful. My team is incredibly small. There's eight of us. We serve the city and the region. And our goal early on was to protect, my goal with my team especially, was to protect their health and safety. We are also critical and serve such different uh, needs and functions that we've got three people working on what I call keeping the lights on in GIS. And then five of us are exclusively supporting our COVID response. So one person out um, is, a, is a challenge. Two people out, it gets to be, you know, it's going to put us in crisis mode. Um, but the ability for folks to work remotely uh, enhancing their health and safety, but then also maybe they are sick or maybe they do have to take care of a child, being able to still work remotely and communicate with each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's a priceless, it's a priceless, priceless tool for us to be able to do that. This is Lynn. I just wanted That's to follow right. up, and I don't have stock in any of these companies, but uh, we've been using, uh, I probably do in some kind of a retirement account, but uh, we've been using Microsoft Teams for staff, yeah. and that has been, just like Lori said, um, a real game changer in, you know, how to coordinate, because normally when we, we all had our VPN and our emergency um, abilities to work from afar, but normally the power's out and the cell phone towers are down for us. So this was really a fun time to see what it's like to have an emergency and actually have power and um, internet capability. And that piece I wasn't as familiar with before. And as Lori said, it was a game changer. It, it worked from day one. Yep. I might just add one other comment there. Um, while we were familiar with a lot of these tools in our, among our staff and have, have used them for a long time, mostly because for us to get to a meeting, even on normal times, uh, you know, if I have a meeting at, at our hall of administration, that's a, you know, a nine mile drive. So that takes me an hour um, each way. So we often do web meetings and, and interact that way just as a way to save commute time. Um, but I think the other thing, and I'm sure everyone's seen this is because we can track these things and document these things with all these great tools and communication technologies, not only is it protecting health and safety or child care needs or other issues for staff who need to work from home, I think it's also making, at least for us, because of our commute issues, way more productive than normal times. And the reason being, instead of me waking up at you know five in the morning having my coffee and then heading out into traffic for an hour commute each way i go have my coffee and i'm sitting down at my computer starting my work day an hour earlier and you know same thing on the back end i'm you know i'm able to respond to issues and emails and and other things late into the evening because it's not a big deal to 
check my computer before I go to bed. And sometimes, you know, because this is an emergency situation, there's things we can get done well beyond normal work hours. And, and I think from our team across the board, that's been happening on evenings, weekends, you know, strange times. I get email, I, you know, I got an email from one of my staff at 1.30 in the morning, uh, um, you know, the other day, because he was just trying, he was into the work, you know, we're all in this because we love the work. And we were working on a new um, analytical dashboard for our recovery program. We're starting to move into some of that. Um, and it's not like, oh, I need to get out of the office because I gotta go pick up my kid at daycare, which would have been this this person's situation. He could, his kid was right there with him. So it's easy to say, you know what, I'm gonna put the kid to bed and I'm gonna finish this or you know that sort of stuff. So in some ways, at least for us, not just in an emergency setting, we're already looking at how are we going to continue this kind of work as a money saving issue, um, teleworking, as we go through our recovery, because we're facing a billion dollar deficit in LA County, and we need to find ways to cut costs. One of those being, maybe we can give up leases on office space um, over the next year or two and have more people work from home. So we found it very effective. Yes. Gosh, that's so true. And conversely, always make sure though that you don't hit that point of gosh while we do enjoy what we do i do you know there are those evenings when all of a sudden you look at the clock and you're like how's it nine o'clock when did that happen so do you guys have any words of wisdom that you share with yourself two months ago you know kind of hindsight um, i had to have a distinct talk with myself about um stopping work at a reasonable hour because you can you can just get caught up in things and go on and on and it's you know it's kind of like that counterproductive thing you find out in grad school that you know how much more is a good idea because you feel worse the next day but um yeah it's just so tempting because everything's right there and for me it's in my living room and i just go to work in my living room and it's it's interesting i love this stuff and I'll wake up thinking about something that'll go through my head and come back and work on it. I'm like, no, that's no longer allowed anymore. I have to set work hours and stick to them. It's healthy. <laughs> Healthy's good. Tom, any, any hindsight you'd share with yourself if you could? Well, I will tell you that, um, that I've always been a proponent of, of um, data standards and data governance. Um, and, I think really what, you know, um, and necessarily two months ago, I would have told myself, but um, I, I guess I recognized through all of this, um, the added and extra importance to, um, to, to that. Um, the, uh, the one thing that I found uh, challenging uh, was that, you know, it's about metadata, right? Um, so the, one of the challenges that we had here in, in Cuyahoga County is, is that we have a county board of health and we have uh, the city of Cleveland's board of health. And so when we were looking at numbers, there was nothing to actually tell us, well, was the county numbers inclusive of Cleveland's numbers or were the two reporting separately? And then what was the metric that was, or what was being used to identify where the case um, you know, was being reported. Was it the hospital that they were located in? Was it the uh, address of residence? Because, you know, you have um, in a metropolitan area such as this, um, you know, Lake County uh, is, you know, well, Cleveland Clinic's a very large regional draw uh, from many surrounding counties. And so, um, you know, the numbers that, that were being reported in Cuyahoga County, were they being reported, um, you know, or how were they being reported? Were they being reported by the hospital or by the actual residence uh, location of, of, the, of the, um, the person infected with coronavirus? So um, that was a, a challenge um, as well. And so, um, you know, the, you've, I think everybody on the call has heard it, um, you know, the, with, from the national level, is that, uh, you know, are the numbers of, of victims, you know, people with the coronavirus, are, are they being underreported? Are they being overreported? Um, one of the things that really concerned me was, and you know, this is really sort of data analytics, is how many tests were administered, how many tests were returned, um, what was the infection rate, and then I had somebody actually ask me, well, I want to show you, I want to show everybody the recovery rate, and I said, well, you know, there's, there's, there's no, we call about authoritative data uh, or trusted data, uh, there was no data that I trusted 
uh, to give me a good number on on uh, those that that were recovered. Um, and so, you know, it's that it it really raises an ethical question of you know should you report numbers that you that you don't have confidence in. Um, so. Again, it's it's about the governance, metadata, data standards. You know, are we all following the same rules when it comes to reporting? Um, and I had no assurances that that actually was was taking place um, with with the data that we were receiving. So, um, you know, and I, and I think, quite honestly, uh, beyond this, and not what I learned two months prior to, but I think we're going to learn a lot um, in in the months that follow, um, and even in the years that follow, because um, hopefully they're they're not correct, but this may make a resurgence. And if it does, um, then you know we, we'll have some time and more data to to analyze. But I think I'm looking forward to seeing um, you know what comes out on the other side as far as uh, lessons learned and and sort of the um, you know the the impact of all this uh, from a data standpoint and GIS standpoint. I think we've done a, a phenomenal job as a country um, in in the GIS realm. This has done amazing things for our technology. Um, as was uh, reported by NISJIC and and Eurissa and a number of other uh, our geospatial colleagues out there, um, this has done a, something um, you know for our industry uh, that I don't think um, has ever been done before. And it's a shame that it had to happen under under such a cloud of a you know a, a tragic cloud. But um, we'll take it as a silver lining um, to this uh, and and move forward. Uh, but again, I think the, the days weeks months and years to come, we're going to learn quite a bit, uh, you know, about this. And I can't wait till uh, the next ERISA GIS Pro that we, we have all of these uh, hubs and lessons learned. And, um, you know, I'm sure uh, Esri is going to have, a, a, you know, some, some great uh, discussions um, at, at the UC this year and, and next year and, and actually for years to come. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff we have. I'm curious too to see what lessons have, we'll all learn because I do feel that there's obviously a lasting impact of this pandemic and how it has and will continue to transform the global view and use of GPS. So, Lori, I wonder what your impression is on if you think this will stimulate a modernization effort for government's IT. Steve um, wrote back in the question and answer that for LA County, absolutely, but I wondered about the city of Sioux Falls. I think that a lot is going to change as a result of this event, both for GIS and for how the city does business. And I think it sometimes does take these huge monumental events, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case it does, to change our culture regarding how we, for example, perceive GIS. As everybody probably on this, on this panel and listening can attest to, there's always this preconceived notion that, you know, we make maps, right? And we, we sometimes don't have that vehicle to share, you know, sort of the bountiful analytics that we're performing on a daily basis. And I think this has given us just this huge, this huge platform for it. You know, GIS is so often, you know, kind of behind the scenes. And it's funny because people don't realize how efficient our groups can be unless something stops working, right? Somebody maybe accidentally publishes a, a map service incorrectly, right? And that, that causes, you know, a terrible ripple effect if that happens. Or if, um, you know, the internet is slow or goes down, right? That happens so incredibly seldom, thank goodness, but it does happen. I think what we're gonna see, um, both with my department and then kind of with IT, you know, we're, we're, we're already seeing that shift. You know, we really worked quickly to get a, like that WebEx product for our entire team. Um, IT really challenged themselves and within literally hours, they made this happen. And this is something that kind of goes against their principles, which is, which I completely understand. You'll all completely understand. You know, we want to do everything very slowly and vet it and demo it. But there does come a time when there isn't that sort of, of bandwidth. But I would like to reiterate two kind of really, two things that I think Steve and maybe Tom said as well. Productivity in this new work environment. I have heard from every one of my staff how incredibly productive 
they are able to be now because of that. You know, we, Steve, we don't have near the commute that you have to work in the morning, but it's still 20 to 30 minutes, you know, each way. And also this ability even for our hourly workers to work remote, that has never happened before. And I could not be happier. It's really shown how um, our staff can rise up. But then a quick nod to what Tom said as well. You know, it's sort of a, you know, what would I share with myself two months ago? And I think I knew this two months ago, but of course, kind of how I alluded to the lowest common denominator. This event has been an incredibly hard reminder of why having data governance protocols in place would have changed many facets and the speed of our response. Great thing to, like you said, you think you knew it two months ago, but just, you know, it kind of buys <laughs> that thought. For so at this point, we'll open the discussion to include our attendees. So if you'd like to pose a question to the panel, be sure to enter it using either the chat or the Q&A function at the bottom of the application window. We do have one question already. Are you seeing an increase in GIS support or GIS use for other departments, for example, for works or roads since no cars are on the road or even trying to put underutilized staff to work in other departments with easy to use GIS tools. And Steve, I thought we'd start with you on this one because it sounded like you alluded to this earlier. Yeah, I'd say we're seeing some of that starting to percolate more now, but not because of the active part of the emergency, but more that we're getting hopefully towards the tail end um, and moving into what our recovery programs. So in this particular week, that's really kicked off and GIS has been tasked to support um, two of the recovery teams that I'm aware of, and that may not be all of them. Um, one is um, related to our, our homeless population. So there, there's been an ongoing program to use unused hotel space to house people mm -hmm. and get them off the streets so that they're in a safer environment uh, where they would have lower risks of exposure. Um, but now that's uh, spun up at the state level and what happened at the state level was some consulting firms were brought in, I guess, uh, you know, at that level to build out these tools for leasing and managing of the hotel spaces. And we were asked this week to take that over for the LA County portion. So, you know, that's an example where suddenly our real estate division, our planning division, our homeless initiative folks, um, all these people that actually fun function out of our uh, county CEO's office who are they've been aware of JS and sort of been around the edges of it but now they're suddenly seeing the real value of how looking at you know the space and place and people um, in geogra in geographic context is really important for finding where do they need more rooms given a population of people experiencing homelessness um, in, and the other one that's really popped up again with our real estate division that I'd say is you know unfortunately at the low end of GIS uh, use is looking at this idea of how are we going to move to a more teleworking first model where possible um, and reduce our office space. So they just this week asked us to help with that asset management uh, tool um, and building out that. So I think we're seeing a lot of that. I'm sure in other places, uh, again, since we're so big, it's happening at the department levels um, where there may be departments doing that. I know in particular, just because I see it on TV news, um, there's a lot of road construction going on on the freeways right now where they had to replace yeah. a bridge or something um, because no one's out on the highways as much. So, you know, shutting down I-5 in normal times would be catastrophic, but you're not really affecting too many people right now if you do that construction. So I think there are affiliated places it's helping, but I think the biggest ones are for us um, looking at that sort of asset management, um, you know, and availability side that's really opened the eyes of our board of supervisors and our CEO's office. That's a really good point. Uh, we have another question. Now that we've experienced this pandemic, do you think you'll be investing more time and effort into preparing for possible future disasters? And if so, how will you prepare? And I first want to pitch people in because you're sitting right in New Orleans and hurricane season's a coming. So I figured you might be the good one, but you probably are already preparing for those future disasters. We haven't really thought of the pandemic as a, like, as a disaster that we prepared for. So I'd like your take having had experience with hurricanes. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, we we always set up our um, 
a hurricane prep starting March, and we have data mine sponsored by USGS in uh, June 1st of every year. And that's very important to us. So not that we just know the players, but we know the assets and everybody knows um, basically what the uh, predictions are for that year's hurricane season. So we feel rather confident that we've got that piece down. I think this piece has taught us, and I, I was listening to everybody else talk, the people I'm talking to now, I haven't talked to or worked with as much in the past are the economic development people. and. They, they know GIS from a lot of the um, online um, tools that they have. MC was one of them, Remy is another one. They, they're used to that. And I, I don't think they were aware that we can map all that data for them and, that, and we can overlay with other information. So we're becoming much more popular with that group. So as far as preparing for the future, um, I'm on a call tomorrow with our economic development directors. I have some, done work with them in the past in terms of what data sets are looking for to compare to, I'd say, pre-event, but they're going to be sending us a whole lot more information to use to look at, you know, how this event actually changed um, outlooks economically, you know, with the oil and gas and tourism state, and that's pretty bad right now. If you throw a hurricane on top of it, we're just all moving north. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's 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 dire down here in terms of the economic outlooks. And I'm not saying ours is worse than other people's. It's just uh, we're very worried about that. So we're gearing up to do all kinds of support to that sector which I kind of worked with traditionally annually before. I, I think we're going to be doing daily calls now. That's, it's probably what's required because you're right. Like it's one thing to go to the grocery store and, you know, get our hurricane supplies ready, but it's a whole nother avenue when the canned goods are all gone. And you're like, what, what hurricane supplies? I don't have my hurricane supplies. I just ate them. <laughs> <laughs> so many people I know. We have a huge infrastructure within the city um, that you know, came out from years of hurricane prep, and we just activated all those groups to check on each other, make sure supplies could be given to um, you know more of the elderly or the endangered, and that worked like a charm. But it, it's been really interesting that the first thing most of us did was come home and fill up water bottles, and I don't know why. <laughs> So it was nice that we didn't really need to do that. <laughs> that, is, that is good. Well, thanks for that perspective, Lynn. And Rob, I want to jump back to your question. Steve answered it from his perspective. And Rob's question, and I'm going to pitch this to Tom and Lori just to get your take on this. This is the last time, we, the last question we've got time for. It's, are the public expectations for 24-7 information services in because of this. And I'm just curious, Tom and Lori, like what your perspective on this is, because Steve said not so much and my knee jerk was absolutely. But then I read Steve's comment, which is, you know, this flow, the daily briefings where people expect new information coming out every day has, you know, it's around a particular time, but not 24 seven. So I just wondered what Tom and Lori, your thoughts are on this 24 seven information service expectation. Well, Lori, let me, uh, let me go first and, and, and I'll be brief. Um, I, I think, I think that that is true. Um, you know, every here in Ohio, we had wine with the wine, um, and Amy Acton where folks would, would gather around uh, in the study at home order with their, you know, I guess beverage of choice, um, and watch our governor, um, report on metrics of the state of Ohio. Um, and so I think that kind of, um, satiated people, you know, for, for, you know, what, what actually was going on. Um, but I, I think there's a comfort level in knowing that um, there is a 24-hour, uh, you know, availability of data. Um, I will tell you the one thing that I uh, am hopeful for um, that, that comes out of this is, is that citizen engagement portion of it. I, I think we knew that the GIS was a powerful tool for citizen engagement, but uh, the feedback loop and, 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 and getting information out to citizens, but then getting information back from them through that same um, avenue, I think is going to be extremely helpful and powerful for um, informing government, um, you know, and, and how, you know, we respond to our constituency, right? Um, it, it adds to transparency as well. And it's, it's not just, you know, I, I'm hoping that it, that it translates to every department within the county 
Um, I, I want, and I'm very hopeful that uh, this becomes very pervasive in Cuyahoga County. In fact, um, before uh, it literally on March 4th, I had a meeting um, with every department head within the county, and I was essentially pushing uh, the pervasive use of GIS across all departments. And I think uh, that, you know, and, and again, uh, the, the uh, after the event, uh, you know, uh, TRIA or the, the, uh, what, the lessons learned event that we have from this, uh, hopefully um, it, it is proof that uh, that 24 hour availability of data and the, and the portal for citizen engagement and feedback um, will, will definitely be a tool that will be used um, to actually uh, serve the public um, from, a, from a remote standpoint, right? We're all gonna be working from home um, in the future. Well, I'm sure our constituency wants to work from home as well and uh, be able to communicate effectively with Cuyahoga County um, through portals. Uh, you know, it, the GIS I think can, can help um, support. Um, so yeah, I, I, think, I think that, uh, you know, this technology is very transformative in that nature and, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, this is Lori. I think there is no doubt that the data we are sharing and the products we are sharing and the applications we are sharing are, they're not even needed. What's the word? They're not wanted 24 hours a day. They are needed and must be available 24-7. Uh, we have learned that with the way we process our, kind of our nightly admin scripts and a lot of processes we have going on at night. We run those in such a way such that uh, everybody will be able to get the data they need, regardless if they are the public or if they're internal employees. And honestly, I wanted to share that. That's one of our struggles right now. We have a couple processes at night that run outside of any and all traditional working hours, even for the night owls, but we're starting to run into those people where they're saying, how come I got bumped at, you know, blank o'clock? And there's not a whole lot I can do about that, right? Because it's like a five hour, seven hour cycle of work happening. But I think what that does is it challenges me then to ensure that the processes we're running, you know, really lessen any ill effects on our users, regardless if they are internal or external. Nope, great, great perspectives and good points. And Thanks, Steve, for grabbing that initially. Um, we are past the top hour, so I do want to thank you all for attending today's ERISA pandemic panel, Perspectives from Across the Country. ERISA is dedicated to supporting GIS professionals at all stages in their careers with great education content. We encourage you to leverage ERISA Connect, accessible at connect.erisa.org. To continue this discussion, Greg and Oscar, I saw you post some questions. If we don't go get those answers today, we can start use those to start the conversation on ERISA Connect and we can also share any lessons learned. I'd love to hear from you guys and see which resources you're using. And finally, be sure to check out our upcoming ERISA programs, including our GIS Leadership Academies. We hope to be able to resume hosting our academies in person with the next scheduled to be in Portland, Oregon in August, then St. Petersburg, Florida in November, and the Minneapolis offering was moved to June 2021. Also, GIS Pro 2020 is coming up at the end of September. Again, if conditions permit, we'll meet in Baltimore, but if not, virtual alternatives are being explored. So remember to visit the ERISA webpage for the most up-to-date offerings and resources and news. And with that, I want to sincerely thank our panelists for sharing their insights. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Do stay safe and be well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Zan, for moderating. It was yeah, great. Thank you. Thank My you. Pleasure.